Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done nearly 600 of them now. I think next week is going to be number 600. And uh, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out some of the previous ones, then please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And there's also a donations page, which explains some alternatives to PayPal. Um, my guest today is Gautam Sachdeva. Welcome, Gautam. Thank you, Rick. A privilege to be on your show. Yeah, it's a privilege to have you. Um, Gautam is in Mumbai, India, and uh, Gautam, you sent me a pretty long bio, which I'll put up on the web page, but I think it would bore people if I read it. So, sure. so rather than me reading a long bio, why don't you just kind of tell us some, something about yourself, whatever you consider to be the highlights and that you'd like people to know for, at the beginning of this conversation. Sure, Rick. Thank you. Firstly, Rick, I really wish that your channel reaches 700,000 subscribers. I think right now it's about 77,000. Yeah, and, that would be nice. And I, I think if it gets more popular in India, that becomes a possibility. Good, yeah. In fact, when you break 100,000, I think YouTube sort of sits up and takes notice and starts giving you more support and stuff. So that would be a good, uh, good goal to begin with. But 700,000 wouldn't be bad. <laughs> So uh, I guess I could begin with uh, the most important event in my life, which was uh, the loss of my father at the age of 14. I think anyone who has lost a parent when they are young would go through exactly what we went through. It was later on, Rick, that thanks to a phrase which Joel Goldsmith used, where he said the dream of duality gets punctured. I think in hindsight, that is what happened to me. Because uh, being young and facing challenges at a young age, including, uh, you know, the fear of survival, of uh, running an office without knowing much, and one challenge after another kind of prepped me up for what was to come in life later on. And that is why I feel that it is also a gift to receive blows in life early. And as uh, Ramana Maharshi says that, you know, it's the first blow, if not the first, the second, then the third, but eventually everyone gets on to the path. And so I think that's where my unconscious journey began. And then the usual, uh, you know, ups and downs and challenges at work, because I was about 24 when I took over the office finally. And that was very challenging uh, as I was the youngest in the office and I had to deal with all these clients, suppliers. So it taught me a lot about relationships. Just dealing with everyone, dealing with people, getting work done. So that became my training ground, my preparation. And things went along till what was for me the most significant phase of my life, which was around 1998 to the year 2000. And three things happened then. The first was the culmination of my mother's own journey of awakening. And then in November 1999, I had a chance meeting with Eckhart Tolle in Hong Kong. And then I met my teacher in February 2000. So at that time, these were insig insignificant to me, at least consciously. I had no will to be on this path consciously. There was no intent. My sister dragged me to meet Eckhart because she and her friends had organized. And she said, this author, he's written a great book and we've, we're bringing him to Hong Kong. And why don't you spend an hour with him one to one? That's how it was in those days. And I said, oh, no, I have come for a holiday. I'm going to go shopping in Hong Kong. <laughs> and, you know, thanks to my sister, Nikki, she actually forced that uh, meeting upon me. 
and in hindsight i feel that uh, it was extremely significant extremely significant it was like a catalyst something was received i can't say it was a transmission or anything of that nature it was more like a recognition the deep peace and stillness and attention which i sensed at that meeting somehow stayed at the back of my mind and then two months after that some friends the same friends from hong kong were visiting mumbai to uh, visit ramesh's satsangs and i had to drop them there on a sunday morning and i protested because you know it was a late saturday night and i really didn't feel like going and so then they said you know you might as well go up the next time and see what's going on and once again nikki said okay let's go and i was there and little did i know rick because it was not for me love at first sight or there were no lights flashing it was just something very gentle and nice but little did i know that i would end up going there for the next 9 years now you you mentioned ramesh's first name but you're referring to ramesh balsakar so for the sake of the yes, audience that's yeah right. okay good yes. yeah yeah and so that for me was the start of my spiritual unfoldment one could say <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of like your sister in terms of like getting my sisters to, you know, come on, you got to learn to meditate and things like that and you know, kind of egging them along. <clears throat> Natural born proselytizer. Um so really one's will actually, I mean, there was no conscious will you see and yet grace and the universe I think supports all of us on our journey and if we surrender and trust it it takes us where we are meant to go that that has been my experience yeah which implies that there's an intelligence sort of orchestrating things in the universe and that we can tune into that and cooperate with it or not yes yeah absolutely what's your take on reincarnation do you believe in that you see this is uh, there are two aspects to this rick and uh, one is as you must be knowing in the circles of non duality and advaita there's this kind of absolute view that there's no such thing as reincarnation but you see it all depends on what we define if i can just go into this for a minute what is being reincarnated you see there are two theories one is that the ego dies with the body the death of the ego is the death so it is not the same ego that reincarnates but the other aspect is that the vasanas and the sanskaras the ball of desires and tendencies does go from birth to birth to birth till it is resolved so to speak so which definition does one use for the ego depends what is reincarnation certainly the ego does not reincarnate because it dies with the body but this ball of vasanas and sanskaras does move on as a process of evolution so that is my understanding of the subject but either way in this incarnation here and now in this incarnation the issues the patterns the data that we have as part of our conditioning our programming and uh genetics etc and how we bring peace to the equation my search was a search for peace of mind and rick i remember that when i started visiting uh, ramesh's satsangs and he would say to everyone what do you want most in life do you want enlightenment or do you want self realization and these were very big words for me i had not really heard them much before i didn't understand the meaning and then he would say all that a human being wants whether they know it or not is peace of mind and i felt this is so simple because at the end of the day when i come home in the evening it is that peace which to me at least seems to be of priority and then because i was on this path i was meeting many yogis and psychics and gurus and teachers and some of them said oh peace is not the only thing you know there are other things there are practices there's this that 
So I went through a phase of confusion. And one day I picked up talks with Ramana Maharshi. I still remember talk 146, where I read, the state of equanimity is the state of bliss, full stop. And then he says, the declaration in the Vedas, I am that, is to enable one to gain equanimity of mind. So Rick, I put that book down and I said that Ramana Maharshi's confirmed that at the end of the day, a life of peace and equanimity, something as tangible as that, is perhaps what one could call the quest. Yeah, I was. it's good you mentioned that because I was going to say, you know, we could probably take it a step further than saying peace of mind to say happiness, you know, because why do you want peace of mind? Well, it makes you happy. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely. and, you know, when we say I am that or thou art that, um, the that that is being referred to is often described as existence, what is it, existence, consciousness, bliss. So bliss is one of, one yes. of the kind of essential characteristics of it. And that's what we seek. And uh, what Ramesh would clarify is, it is the bliss of peace, deep right. peace, it is what Ramnam Harshi was referring to, referring to. But on a funny note, I must tell you, a friend of ours who's not a follower of Ramnam Harshi one day said, I really don't know what these two guys are up to. On one side, Ramana Maharshi says, who am I? And on the other side, Nisaddatta Maharaj says, I am that. <laughs> and that's all they say. It goes together. And <laughs> that, that was quite Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, you know, Ramana is just trying to get you to realize I am that by saying, who am I? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so, yes, so coming back to, you know, peace, that became for me the the benchmark, the measure, uh, what Ramesh would call uh, when the thinking mind does not go into the dead past or an imaginary future, is when the peace is there. And uh, so that became the whole process, you know, this this beautiful acceptance of the will of the source at all times. And as Joel Goldsmith, who I was uh, quite taken up by, would say to give up the belief in two powers, good and evil, which is basically the foundation of duality. So this natural acceptance of what is became so spontaneous. I mean, so available all the time. And of course, there were things one didn't like. That's a natural part of the process, but accepting that too, that became a way of living. Yes, which is not to say that you became a sort of a, a pushover or, or passive or, you know, just sort of whatever, you know, oh, you want to have all my money? Here you go. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously you must have running a business. You must have been decisive about things and, you know, making all kinds of decisions and, you know, is, should it be this or should it be that? But yeah, I'm reminded of a Gita verse which says you have control over action alone, never over its fruits. So you do, you do yes. your best in, in your, your moment to moment actions, but then whatever the fruits, you don't have control over that. Yes, and actually, Rick, it made me, I could use the word more courageous because by nature I was an introvert and timid. But I think with the understanding, with knowing that the results are not in your control, and also knowing that you are an instrument of God, the way you have been shaped by the divine, that kind of gave a confidence to express oneself more. Yeah, good. It worked that way. The reason I asked you about reincarnation, and we can get into this more, is just that a lot of times people who have sort of gotten onto the spiritual path and uh, just have this sense that it's not the first time, you know, that they have a... a many lifetimes history of of seeking god or seeking enlightenment or whatever and that and in fact it says that in the gita too arjuna asks krishna well what happens if you die before you get enlightened and krishna says well you pick up where you left off basically <laughs> yes yes absolutely yeah. so you know that is why nisraddatta maharaj would say to his audience in the satsang that it's not about just dropping the physical body which is going to in any case happen 
but we have to drop the subtle body as well which means basically all the innate tendencies and you know we are back to the vasanas and sanskaras and so you know his whole teaching of you're not the body abide in your being was in that sense a teaching of liberation because if one got it so to speak then the question of reincarnation would not even come up as a concept because even in the life itself we are not reincarnating a thought upon thought upon thought if one has reached that level so to speak yeah and actually what what obviously happens when we die maybe it's not obvious is that we do drop the physical body of course but in general we don't drop the subtle body and i, I know yes. you published a book by rob schwartz uh Yes. who I've interviewed and who talks about what happens between lives and how we kind of like review the past life and set up the conditions for the next one and so on. And, you know, what is it, what is the entity who is doing all that between, without a physical body? Well, it, uh, presumably it's the subtle body. And then the subtle body takes on another physical body so it can kind of keep, keep yes. on working things out. Yes, so either way, Life is about working things out. If not our ego from a past life, someone else, is, yeah. which is irrelevant, but we have to work it Yeah, we, we can explore that, that, whether it would be ours or someone else's. We'll get into that as we go along. <laughs> but a question came in. Well, let me ask this, unless you wanted to say something just now. I just wanted to add something about Robert Schwartz's book, Your Soul's Plan, which we published in India. What I liked about it, Rick, was he, I think, regresses people to the pre-birth stage. And in most of the cases, he finds that, like, I remember there was a story of an alcoholic, of an AIDS patient, that the life path was predetermined in the pre-birth stage. And not only of that person, but the family and friends around that person in that incarnation. And the roles they and were going to play with him and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and their understanding and what they had to learn from, let's say, the alcoholic. It was not just about the alcoholic learning a life lesson. And that is why Ramesh's teaching for me was so appropriate because he would say daily living means relationships. Whether it is a stranger, whether it is your colleague, whether it is your family member or your lover or whatever, it means dealing with people and peace of mind is to be found through those relationships. <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> some, some people are probably raising their eyebrows right now. <laughs> um, yeah, one thing I recall from my conversation with Rob and from his book is that, you know, you, you sort of choose certain major life events that are going to be conducive to your evolution, but they're not necessarily cut in stone. Um, and there's a the verse in the Yoga Sutras which goes, Heyam Dukkha Managatam, which means avert the danger which has not yet come. And that implies that, you know, a danger might be coming in terms of some life event that, you know, you've signed up for, but you can actually avert it or at least minimize the impact of it by taking certain steps. Mm hmm Which implies, to my mind, uh, some choice, some free will. And that's a whole can of worms that we need to unpack. Um, and we'll, we'll explore uh, that. I, it reminds me of an uh, incident between uh, devotee of Ramana Maharshi, Mudaliyar. And he tells Ramana Maharshi that, you know, I can understand that the big things in life are predetermined. Like, you know, one's profession, marriage, death, etc. And so then Mudaliyar puts his fan down onto the ground and says, is this also predetermined? And Ramana Maharshi says, yes, right from the moment of birth, every act the body has to go through is predetermined, but. And Mudaliyar says, are you saying there's no freedom? He says the freedom one has is to strive for and acquire jnana, wisdom. That is the freedom one has. So I think what you are suggesting fits in with this because one could call it one's attitude to life or let's say buddhi working in a certain situation, you know. So with that wisdom comes a potential to transcend 
the polaric opposites of destiny and free will, so to speak. So we can explore that more, but that's what I feel uh, it implies. Yeah, we'll explore that. Um, yeah, so Ramana didn't say, well, you know, if you're meant to you know, aspire for jnana, then you will, and if you're not, you're not. He said, no, you have, you should aspire for it, you know, like, Absolutely. get on. <laughs> and, and this is another mistake, uh, Rick, which is commonly made, that it's a path of no effort. You know, even uh, Nisardatta Maharaj would tell his, uh, his audience that meditate an hour a day, two hours a day, abide in your being. Now, that is all sadhana. I mean, you know, I mean, if you have to skip the sadhana, you're obviously already very evolved if you're already in that place. But for most of us, the practice, the inquiry, who am I, is effort. So I wouldn't, I'm a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to these points, because I don't believe that no effort is needed. No effort, effort is needed till one realizes that no effort is needed. Yeah, perfect. Um, reminds you of another Gita verse, no effort is lost and no obstacle exists. Even a little of this Dharma removes great fear. And so, and, and you know, it's funny here, here's the key of it. I think, you know, you mentioned absolute view a little while ago and, um, is the, to my understanding and to some degree experience there we can think of different sort of dimensions or levels of reality and they're all they're paradoxical with relationship to one another but they're also true each in their own domain so i mean if we want to go to the you know manduka upanishad or the ashtavakra gita or you know nagarjuna and, and other sages they'll say nothing ever happened you know there's no universe yeah. Uh, and right. then others might emphasize, well, yeah, things are happening, but it's all, all is well and wisely put. It's all just the play of the divine. And others would say at a different level, um, you know, do things. I mean, children are starving or, you know, climate change or yeah, you have to actually take action in the field of relativity. And all those are right, but each on their own level. And they, they seem to contradict one another, but I think it's more like layers of a cake, you know, which each have their own uh one holds up the other kind of yeah that's beautiful and in fact ramana maharshi himself said also in the 40 verses on reality that there is neither destiny nor free will so like you said one of the layers because when you uh, are no longer identified with the body then you are destiny is destiny of the body yeah not destiny of consciousness so when you are no longer identified with the body then there is neither the polaric opposite of destiny nor free will so that's, like you said, it's the layers. Yeah. And the key to that, that sentence is when you are. Because, I, yes. uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I have, I've been taking some classes with Swami Sarvapriyananda, and I sent, him, um, I sent him your website and some thoughts that I was thinking about, about this conversation. And he sent me back an interesting article by a guy named Arindam Chakrabarti, if you know him. And uh, last night in his Gita class, he talked all about this whole topic, um, perhaps because of our exchange. Um, but, uh, oh, now what was I going to say about that? <laughs> um, well, basically what we're, we're saying, which is that there are these different levels of reality, you could say. And even though perhaps the ultimate reality is more real than the relative realities, we live in the world of relative realities and we can't just sort of apply the reality of uh, one level to level to uh, to another level Absolutely. in fact swami Absolutely. swami ji was saying that when he was a, a young brahmachari in the ashram sometimes people would say oh it'll happen if it's the will of ramakrishna or if it's the will of god and and they would sometimes be scolded by the senior monks who would who would say you know don't say what you don't know i mean you know be true to your own level of experience Beautiful, so true. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to be talking too much, um, but uh, get, I, but I am. <laughs> I think I'm the one talking. No, you're the one who's supposed to be talking. <laughs> Siddharamishwar Maharaj says we are all babbling in illusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just make one more point, and then I'll try to shut up. Um, but I won't succeed. But. Um, and that is that, like, the Gita is a good example also, because in some verses, you know, Krishna says things like, I'm doing everything anyway, you know, and in other verses, he says, you know, get off, 
get on, stand up and fight. You know, you do, you have to do something. Um, right. And and so both of those are true, even though they they are paradoxical. Yes, and also I feel that you know when the reader reads any holy book like the Gita, what clicks with which sentence at what moment in time for the reader, that is what is appropriate. So he may pick up the first instance where Krishna says, I'm the one who does everything, or he may pick up where Arjuna is told, pick up the bow and fight. So because it works on so many levels. So, you know, if we try to see it at one level, we'll say, oh, there's so much contradictory in the Gita. But if we just go line by line, read it para by para, what goes into our consciousness is what is meant to and what impacts us will do so at that moment. Yeah. I was told that Nisargadatta Maharaj once said that the, the ability to appreciate paradox and ambiguity is a characteristic of, of spiritual maturity. And so, you know, at, using the Gita as a case in point, I don't think we have to say, okay, well, I like these verses, but not these. I think that the trick is to kind of expand our perspective to realize that they all fit into a larger picture. Yes, beautiful. And he would also say that, uh, you know, read, you're so used to reading the Gita from the point of view of Arjuna, but try reading it from the point of view of Krishna, like we said earlier, levels. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you suddenly read it through that lens, you start seeing different things which you didn't see earlier. Yeah. That I feel is... Uh, the beauty of it. Good. I remember uh, there was this, uh, in Hong Kong, there was a bar called the Devil's Advocate. So we had gone there for a drink. This is 20 years ago. And in the menu, there was a quotation which said, uh, apologies to the devil, for we haven't heard his, his side of the case. After all, God has written all the holy books. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's some books that he might have authored, <laughs> but you haven't published them. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's a question that came in from Rajiv Lochan Tripathi uh, from somewhere in India. Um, Nisargadatta Maharaj talks about consciousness and the Absolute, and he says that consciousness is, quote, I am, and the Absolute is without qualities and beyond consciousness. Can you throw, throw some light on the difference between consciousness and the Absolute? That's a good question. You see, in fact, this is what distinguishes Maharaja's teaching from Ramana Maharshi's, because as far as Ramana Maharshi's teaching was, is all there is the Self. And Maharaj made this distinction of consciousness and prior to consciousness. Brahman and Parabrahman. But Rick, the fact is that, you know, even that has to happen within consciousness. The idea of prior to consciousness is within consciousness. So what Maharaj would say is the leap to awareness is not the leap the individual can take. Abiding in your being, the I am, is the extent, so to speak, one can go to and then that leap into the awareness happens. And why, why does something prior to consciousness, if something like that exists, have to take place within consciousness, if that's the way you just said it. Because otherwise you'd be a dead body. Well, you wouldn't be conscious of it if, it if it's not within consciousness, but does that mean it couldn't exist? But you'd still be in manifestation as consciousness. In manifestation as consciousness. Now, Prior to consciousness can happen in the living state, so to speak, right? That's what we are talking about. Yeah, I mean, people do talk about living in a state of Parabrahman, and I can't really opine on that one way or the other. It's not my experience. But um, it's a good question this guy asked, because it's one that I've pondered but really don't understand, you know, whether there could be something, whether, whether consciousness is somehow in a subtle way emergent you know, or if it's really the bedrock of, of reality or of the universe. No, well, Maharaj would clearly say that the awareness is awareness not aware of itself, but aware of itself as I am. So awareness not aware of itself 
is aware of itself as I am, and then that I am is the me. And Maharaj was clearly talking about awareness, not aware of itself. And that's why he would say, what were you a hundred years before you were born and a hundred years after you will die? Huh. That is what he was pointing at, that awareness. Yeah. Which then appears with the form of the body as I am, and then I am Gautam, I am Rick, and so on. Yeah. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi talked about something similar. He, he talked about, he, he, he kind of went through this real subtle sort of se sequential emergence of creation. And he said there's a stage at which consciousness hasn't become self-referral yet. It hasn't become conscious of itself. And then at a certain point, because it's consciousness and because there's nothing else down there to become aware of, it becomes aware of itself. And then that sets that right. sets up a sort of a threefold structure of observer observed and process of creation, and then the whole manifestation emerges from there. Okay, I have a bunch of notes here. I could ask you something else, but is there something on your mind that you'd like to go off with at this point? Not really, but uh, you know, in the years of uh, being with Ramesh for nine years, and thereafter my own process, my own journey, what I noticed was that you know, this quality of peace of mind, especially on the path of Jnana Yoga and Advaita, one tends to get lost in a lot of concepts. But when it comes down to daily living, you know, peace of mind in daily living, that tends to get lost. And what, uh, your so voice got cut off there. It tends to get what, did you say? Missed. Yes, missed. It tends okay. to get missed. You see, and so this constant bringing back, which is perhaps why I resonated with Eckhart Tolle's teaching, which was all about being in the present moment, and uh, Ramesh's teaching of peace of mind and daily living. They were so tangible and so real. And uh, because I do consider Eckhart to be, in his own nature, master of non-duality, because it, it's all actually the same, you see. But what I like was that this brings you to here and now and not getting lost in a conceptual forest. Like uh, in the ultimate understanding, Ramesh's first sentence was, spiritual seekers are lost in a conceptual forest created by their own imagination. Mm -hmm. Ramesh said you that? See, so that's what, yeah. So that's what tends to happen. And so to just make the focal point, one's peace and equanimity and dealing with situations in life, and daily living as simple beauty in simplicity. You know, Ramesh would keep saying beauty in simplicity. And as the saying goes, the truth is simple. If it was complicated, everyone would get it. <laughs> That's funny. That's good. Well, you know, the whole thing of Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, right? That, um, you know, hearing something, thinking about it, and, and uh, you know, then really sort of deeply probing into it experientially. Um, there are a lot of people uh, who just don't do all three and they might just read a whole lot of books and get kind of top heavy in terms of theories and yes. philosophies and so on and could even convince themselves that they're actually living what they're reading about, but it's all conceptual and you know, they haven't really gained the deep experiential ground of it. Yes, and deep down, they would know the honest answer to the question, are you at peace? Yeah, but that's that's a good thing Ramesh was saying, because most of us live active lives, and the, the rubber kind of meets the road when you have to engage in the world. And it's kind of, you know, the acid test of, of whether the realization is genuine or not, whether, whether you can sort of maintain equanimity spontaneously without trying to maintain it yeah. in the midst of challenges. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And that's why in the early years, because I would visit him only on Sundays because I was working in the week, he would be very keen to know what my week was at work, what were the challenges, because I think he could see then the teaching and operation, perhaps how it was being referred to, looked at situations. And the fact that he was himself a bank manager of the Bank of India made it a very pragmatic, very uh, kind of uh, touch and feel, I could say, you know, and it brought, it certainly brought not only a result in my daily living, but many people who I saw there coming uh, continuously for a long time. That, that was beautiful to see. Yeah, we started off this 
conversation talking about challenges. You mentioned challenges, and uh, perhaps you could comment on the sort of spiritual value or evolutionary value of challenges. Because, you know, obviously most people would prefer not to have them and to just live a smooth, easy life, but we're constantly beset by challenges. And, you know, you and I have it pretty easy compared to many people in the world. Um, and, you know, it makes people question the existence of God that so many people are having such a horrible time. Like right now there's a war brewing in, you know, Israel and Palestine. So, um, you know, maybe you could reflect upon that topic. Yes, because uh, challenges imply suffering and uh, suffering of me as the ego suffering. And so that is why I feel that these challenges, at least on individual levels, are just, you know, pushing us inwards. Because when we see that whatever we depend on outside is transient and pleasure turns to pain and pain last and then pleasure comes and, you know, buffeted between the banks of pleasure and pain, as Nisardatta Maharaj would say, one says, what is life about? And then the journey goes within and the turning away from the self, as Maharaj says, turning away from the small self is what happens. And I think then that that marks the beginning of the journey of awakening. When your peace of mind, you are very clear, cannot be found in the flow of life because the flow of life is sometimes pain, sometimes pleasure, but it can be found in one's attitude to life, one's understanding, one's acceptance, then it is being found within. As Joel Goldsmith keeps referring to the kingdom God of God is within. Right. Which I, I think Jesus must have said. Yeah. And what about people you think who what do you think about people who face severe challenges? I mean, terrible diseases or, you know, I don't even want to name the things, cause, but we know how, how horrible it is for some people in this world. Do you think that somehow in the big picture of things, their soul is being taught that the outer life is not to be relied upon and that they, they ultimately have to turn within? I mean, because again, you know, people might say, well, how could there be a God if the Holocaust happened or this happened or that happened, uh, my son died at three years old or whatever. Um, you know, in the big picture from God's eye view of things, um, what is the value of those things? You see, Rick, the thing is that we project our image of God upon the concept of God and think God should be a certain way. Whereas, uh, you know, if God is just looked at as consciousness, which is attributeless, you know, then these demands on God, that God should not create, you know, like Ramesh would say, uh, no, we complain to God, God, why did you create handicapped children? What harm have they done and to whom? Which is a very honest and real complaint. But he would say that nobody tells God, God, why did you create healthy children? So we are in the realm of duality where polaric opposites of every conceivable kind exist. And so there's health and there's disease. There's black and white, left and right, up and down, front and back, rich and poor, pleasure and pain, and me and the other. So that is the framework you could say that the me is shaped by and has to deal with in daily living. So there's both because if there's someone with cancer, there's someone without cancer. And each journey is so individual, the learning from the, the suffering, the illness. And I think where the teaching steps in is that it takes away the psychological suffering to a large degree. And one is left with what is the suffering to be born as one's lot, so to speak, with a sense of acceptance and calm. This is where many people would bring in reincarnation again, um, particularly in India, where people is part of the culture. They would say, well, if you're born in such and such a circumstance, it's because of some karma. You know, it's not God is not playing dice with the universe. He's not arbitrary or capricious, um, you know. Well, like, again, to, to the Gita, you know, Krishna talks about being born in the families of the pure and illustrious, you know, if you've been on a spiritual path, and or even in a family of yogis, although such a birth as this is difficult to attain on earth. 
Um, so it's it's sort of like I, I totally agree with you about the the polarities thing. You can't have a universe without relative polarities. But in terms of our individual circumstances, it seems to me they're not arbitrary, and that you know there is a sort of a significance to the circumstances in which we're born. Again, referring back to Rob Schwartz's thoughts. Yes, sure, absolutely. It's, I mean, the, the, the law of as you sow, so you yeah, reap. Yeah, there you go. What goes around comes around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, a question came in from Ravi in the United Arab Emirates. Ravi says, isn't it a little dangerous to keep peace of mind or happiness, as Ramesh described it, as a goal on the spiritual path? These terms have connotations in everyday language and could easily become a source of spiritual bypassing. Keeping the mystery of the final experience alive, as the Upanishads do, helps to keep the path genuine. Comments? Well, my view is slightly different, uh, Rick, because, you know, keeping an experience as the kind of goalpost, so to speak, is in fact what can lead to a lot of frustration and a lot of egocentric activity and uh, keeping it at i mean i really don't understand where's the spiritual bypassing if one is just asked to look at one's own daily living and at the end of the day evaluate it and evaluate where one stands in relation to what happens and so uh, i'm not one for uh, this kind of uh, potential experience happening in the future to be the goal and mine is uh, an approach of more walking on the, as Maharaj said, the road is the goal, you know. And also this kind of uh, brings us to a very important point. Is it necessary to have peak experiences or uh, out of body experiences, et cetera, as a marker for one's uh, level of attainment or understanding, et cetera, you see? And uh, I'd like to read out because I had kept uh, some uh, I am that on my table, and if I can read out one sentence, sure, if yeah, I may. please. Because I think it's important on this path, you know, to address this issue. So Maharaj says, with some realization comes imperceptibly, imperceptibly, but somehow they need convincing. They have changed, but they do not notice it. Such non-spectacular cases are often the most reliable. You see, it reminds me of the story where there was a devotee of uh, Bhagwan Ramana Maharshi called Ramanatha Brahmachari. So one day, uh, Bhagwan told him, he said, uh, Ramanatha, you have realized the self. And he said, is it? He said, yes, you have realized the self. He said, are you sure? <laughs> he said, yes, yes, I'm telling you, you have realized. He said, no, I don't believe it. So then he gets up, Ramana Maharshi gets up, knocks him on the head. He says, you have realized the self. And so Ramanatha runs out of the room and goes announcing to everyone what? I've realized the Not that I've realized the oh. self. <laughs> Ramana Maharshi knocked me here on the head. <laughs> You see, so my take is, uh, Rick, that, you know, to keep it as simple and make it as relatable to daily living and see your equations with not only your relationships with the events that transpire in your life, with your thoughts and see where peace is to be found. Yeah, that's a good one. Um... One spiritual teacher said, the goal is all along the path. Um, and I had an experience actually with, uh, with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi one time where I was up on stage kind of shooting my mouth off about this and that, and he was sitting there. And, and I, I was very much in a frame of mind in those days where it's like enlightenment or bust, you know? I mean, I, I, I can't be happy now. I have to I'll only be happy when I achieve this goal. And he, he kind of interrupted and he said, you know, every day is life. He said, don't pass over the present for some glorious future. And that, that really kind of stuck. Beautiful. 
and I eventually settled down and, and feel that way. It's like, you know, all is well and wisely put and things happen in their own time and you can be zealous, you can be focused on, on this kind of stuff, but don't like m make yourself miserable if you haven't achieved what Ramana achieved or, or some such thing. Don't compare yourself with others. Exactly, because, you know, that's what happens. The ego loves to get miserable. And especially if it doesn't have experiences, then it says, oh, I didn't have this experience. I'm not worthy of it and so on and so forth. If we can touch upon uh, the subject of free will just for a couple of minutes. Yeah, let's just make sure we've wrapped up Ravi's question here. So he said, isn't it a little dangerous to keep peace of mind or happiness as a goal on the spiritual path? I think there's no harm in recognizing that all kinds of lovely things may uh, develop along the, the path, um, but you have to sort of, you know, take Eckhart Tolle to heart and just enjoy the now, be in the present, and these things will unfold as as in, in due time, you know, in good course. Absolutely. Yeah. But it would be dangerous to sort of like do what I was doing, which is, you know, just make yourself miserable because you haven't achieved some some future goal. That That is sort of a disingenuous way to live. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. You were going to say about free will. Yes, you know, this uh, whole uh, concept of uh, there is no free will, is there free will, etc. I think uh, the way uh, Ramesh expressed it was quite beautiful, where he said that, of course, in the realm of duality, free will is the mechanism of functioning in daily living. You cannot be without it. As the ego operating day to day, the mechanism is free will. But the understanding is that, as we said in the Gita, the results are never in our control. So our value of free will is really not as great as we thought it was. Because A, the results are not in our control, and B, what, are, what is the foundation of our free will, which is basically our conditioning since we were born, based on which we think certain thoughts, take certain decisions, there are a lot of factors beyond the me which contributed to that, which kind of develops our free will. So his point was that the value which has been assigned to free will is quite unrealistic. So he, he would say if you explore it in that sense, there is no free will at the absolute level. But you have to act as if you have free will because that is the functioning in daily living. Decisions have to be made. You can't sit back and say, oh, nobody does anything, so I'm not going to exercise free will because I have no free will, because in fact, that is doership. Yeah, yeah. Acting against one's nature is doership. Yeah. Um, that, that Gita verse that I quoted earlier, you know, you have control over action alone, never over its fruits. It goes on to say, you know, so don't attach yourself to inaction, um, you know, because you, you, that itself is... Well, that would be lethargy, that would be stagnation. Yes, and that is another pitfall on the path, uh, Rick, you know, that tends to happen when the teaching is kind of, you know, misinterpreted, meaning that it means that. Yeah. And that is why even, uh, you know, when people would visit Ramesh and weren't doing much in life, he would encourage them to take up activities like social service simply because, you know, he said life is about engaging, it's about giving. Because when you give, then the focus is not so much on yourself as the other. And so he would encourage, you know, people to go out. And yes, ultimately he knew that if it was not one's destiny, then no amount of saying it is going to happen. But he was not one to like say, okay, you know, sit back, go to uh, Arunachala and just walk up and down the roads there. No. <laughs> Yeah, nor did he say that, well, if you're meant to be engaged in social social service, it'll just magically happen somehow. He, he said, go do it, you know, right? Yeah, especially I remember, Rick, there was this uh, lady from Europe, and she was a model in her younger years, and now she was in her late 50s, and she told Ramesh that, you know, I was the star of wherever I walked. I walked into hotels, I walked on the street, people would turn around and look at me, and now nobody recognizes me, nobody cares, I'm getting old, gray hair, wrinkled. And she was suffering, Rick, she was really suffering. So he asked her, he said, what do you do now? And she said, nothing, I do nothing. And so he said, you know, because you're so focused on 
me and the body, etc. Why don't you go and if you have so much money, do social work, engage with orphans. You know, they need love, they need compassion. So get involved in that. I think I heard you mention Bridget Bardot in one of your podcasts and how, you know, she was one of the most beautiful women yes. in the world. And she ended up being this great animal activist, you know, doing all kinds yes. of work to help animals. Right. And he gave the example of Krishnamurti and Bridget Bardot watching the same program on television, which was the whales being killed. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Krishnamurti turned off the TV because he could not bear to see the suffering. And Bridget Bardo created this foundation to save the wheels. So each did what was in their nature to yeah. do. And personally, I would sort of give her the, the plaudits for, <laughs> yeah, for doing that. <laughs> yeah. You know? sure. yeah. Um, in another of your interview, in your podcasts, I, I heard you use the, you know, the nursery rhyme, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. And uh, I like that. Uh, that's a very profound nursery rhyme, actually. Um, it is. And, you know, it relates to what we were just saying, which is that, um, you know, the stream, you're, you're pretty much confined to the stream if you're in a boat on it. Uh, you can't think, oh, I'd like to be 100 yards off to the right of the stream or anything because you, 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 your boat would be stuck. Uh, so you're in the stream, but the stream is really doing most of the work. That's where the momentum is, right? But you, you do have an oar, you know, and you can sort of row it gently. And with that, you have a little bit of wiggle room, you know. You, if you're totally passive, you might end up crashing into the rocks. Or if you row too vigorously, why, why are you doing that? Because the stream, you're not going to get there any sooner. The stream is doing the work. But a little bit of sort of discriminative discernment, discernment or guidance or something can make all the difference in the journey. Yes, and it reminds me of what I think Dayanand Saraswati said. When he was asked this question about free will, he said, imagine a goat which is tied to a post on the ground and obviously it can go away from the pole only to a certain extent, which is the length of the rope. So that is the limit of the goat's free will. But within that range, where it goes, what it grazes on, etc., is up to the goat. So it's very similar to what you said that within that, what we do, and uh, how we manage. And I think that is where the wisdom teachings come in to help us manage this river of life in the best possible way of least resistance, going with the flow. I'm glad that this is going the way it is because I, I had a feeling, I, you know, when I didn't know enough about you, I was thinking that you were going to sort of be this kind of fundamentalist, absolutely no free will under any circumstances, you know. But I see that we pretty much think the same way, you know, on this whole topic. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fundamentalist on peace of mind. That is truly, Rick, my priority and what I speak about when I did uh, satsangs at home before the pandemic <laughs> and the Zoom talks. That, because I do feel that that is truly a gift. Peace is a, a very underrated gift. And as uh, Bhagwan himself has said, the greatest siddhi or spiritual power yeah. is peace of mind. I saw a cartoon where a bunch of Buddhists were staging a protest and the leader was saying, what do we want? And the, they would say, peace of mind. When do we want it? Now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I would just like to touch upon uh, the subject of witnessing, if, my, if I may. Excellent. Yes, let's talk about that. So what, what happens when uh, one is uh, actually carrying these concepts as, not as concept, but as living the teaching, so to speak? You know, when, for example, when I don't blame and condemn someone for something they are supposed to have done, I may not like it, I may complain. But there's no judgment, blame and condemnation because I accept that this is precisely the way this person has been made and designed to say what they did. And hurt may arise, but there is no involvement in that. So what happens with this outlook to life? The thinking mind is now less and less involved in the drama and story of life compared to what it used to be. And when that happens, a natural uh, happening is witnessing the movie of life. So it's not really uh, that the ego can say that, oh, I better be the witness. I must witness what happens because that's impossible. The ego is the one which is away from the witnessing. All the ego can do is observe and to observe is to judge. 
but when a teaching any teaching wisdom teaching is in operation it is this wisdom that leads to witnessing the flow of life and when that starts happening for any seeker i think that is the most beautiful start of a most beautiful journey the journey from awakening to deliverance mm. yeah and i would suggest that there are different degrees or levels of witnessing um there can be a, a witnessing where it's just the there's a kind of a, a greater inner silence you know and that kind of contrasts with activity but there can also be a witnessing that you know, of the the true self or pure consciousness which is so self-aware or so well established that in a sense there's no connection whatsoever with the, with outer activity one just rests in that as that and the world carries on as it does yes there are different degrees yes and as uh, ramesh would say you know someone asked him the question what is the difference between witnessing and non-witnessing so he would say that imagine if i am looking at traffic going by on the street and i'm just witnessing it because i'm not involved in it and when there is no traffic there's non witnessing because there's nothing to witness but coming back to witnessing i think the quality of life because it becomes so disengaged from involvement and drama and he said this and she did this and this happened to me and god this this to me and all that garbage is completely annihilated and witnessing is what becomes such a glorious way of being and uh, it is quite uh, beautiful to see when that happens and i might add and i think you'll agree with this that witnessing is not something you do it's something you are i mean it's it's more of a fundamental condition it's not something you consciously remind yourself to do or will to happen or anything yes that in fact like i said takes one away from the witnessing because the ego cannot the ego thinks it can be the witness whereas the witness is the absence of the ego which thinks it can be the witness <laughs> yeah <laughs> in my experience witnessing is actually more kind of clear or dramatic if the activity itself is more intense like if i'm running through a busy airport or playing a sport you know or i'm just sort of you know really then there's the it's it's amusing or interesting to see how there's this deep silence which is just unperturbed by all the intensity yes and as ramesh would say that is also because the working mind is engaged in the moment so even the working mind being in the moment has got the same quality except it is a mind at work but that is why like he would give this very common example at most of his satsangs that the surgeon when he is operating on a patient is in his working mind mode because all his faculties is almost in a zen like state yeah, right because yeah. all his experience and faculties are here and now but if he was told before the operation that you know you better be careful because the guy you're operating on is a very influential politician and if something goes wrong you're in trouble and if during the surgery the mind starts wandering oh god i better be careful like better be careful there is involvement so he's moved away from this state which is full functional working mind and got involved in the process of time um a question came in from a, a friend of mine named um girdar gopal and um he he sent this by email the other day he said recently gautam has presented his mother to his audience and related her experiences with kundalini my question if allowed has has um gautam had any kind of kundalini awakening himself well i would not know that because i have not had any experiences within the body which i have felt like chakras moving and all that kind of stuff but thanks to my mother i have you know being in her presence learned so much about this process that so much of it comes spontaneously to me you know the functioning of uh, the energy and uh, one thing important which she said not in my case but uh, let's say in the case of sages and masters that it is not necessary that everyone experiences the kundalini rising because for example if a there's a master who is a clear channel then you see because the rising of the kundalini is sensed because there are blockages and obstructions in the pathway but if all that is clear then it will ascend now even someone like ram krishna has written in the gospel of ram krishna about the kundalini piercing the chakras so and ramana maharshi had says 
has said kundalini is the self so you see it's actually a very broad term which i think is just the energy and so what i don't know what would qualify as a kundalini experience and whether i have had it frankly that is the honest truth yeah but what you said there i think is really pertinent which is i think a lot of times there can be more fireworks with kundalini stuff if there are a lot of blockages because the kundalini the energy is sort of trying to clear those blockages yes. but if the channels yeah, are clear you might not even experience anything like that exactly and in gopi krishna was a case in point right. who went through a kind of hell with the kundalini yeah. now my this case was not like that rick she was very fortunate that she didn't have to go through all that let's say someone like he went through and she did see the fireworks she saw everything and the end process of the vision she saw was the process of death where the body the subtle body unwinds and merges with the elements and that is when the vision stop so for her query which was also who am i when that whole sequence got answered through her experiences that was the end of experiences yeah yeah this actually loops back to something we were talking about a little while ago which is that um you know some people's path you know there's a verse in the bible some place which says that in heaven the king of heaven sneaks up like a thief in the night and uh and so a lot of times spiritual progress or spiritual awakenings they're so kind of gentle and incremental that you just yeah. kind of feel nothing's happening or you feel normal and you feel good but there's there's nothing nothing flashy going on um and thank god because that is actually a safer way for the unfolding yeah yeah uh, someone i interviewed years ago calls such people oozers you know because they kind of ooze <laughs> into it <laughs> rather than all kinds of dramatic stuff yeah and i think that's actually and that's what gets missed and people get confused because they feel that they haven't had validation or experiences which validate various stages of evolution and that's so not true rick it's so not true i've asked this with my mother i've checked this with people my own experience but it comes down to that what is the criteria you set for yourself where where are you today compared with let's say 2 years earlier 5 years earlier in terms of how you deal with life how you process it what are your thoughts are you more and more present or are you still lost in the living dream of life as simple as that yeah and i've often said this but if you could magically snap back to where you were 10 years ago and be in that state of mind all of a sudden it would even though you felt fine then it would be horrible i think by contrast to the way you feel uh -huh. now that's you know exactly. and vice versa if if you could snap suddenly to where you're going to be 10 years from now or something you would be like oh my god my god this is incredible but <laughs> but when that happens it'll be normal yeah beautiful it's like what again ramesh would say that you know imagine you get your driving license and he calls that let's say the moment of awakening but it's only after a couple of years you're driving down a hellish street let's say in mumbai where there's no like lane culture and all that and after 2 years you look back and say my god 2 years ago if i had driven down this street i would have been shit scared so it is in hindsight then you realize my god things have really changed i'm handling situations differently with the equanimity as bhagwan said with calm and then it's in hindsight that the realization dawns that i was a very different person some time ago yeah who was it you said recommended a couple hours of meditation and all was that ramesh or was that nisargadatta or maharaj Ma maharaj Ara okay yeah. yeah yeah because even when i was uh, i used to visit his translator mullar patan mm -hmm. and he would say that that in fact sometimes the foreigners would go in the morning and maharaj would be reading his paper and he didn't like that they were sitting there and looking at him <laughs> intently but he's the one who told them you meditate so they would come and meditate and uh, he he was in favor of it right and you know maharaj's first book i don't think many people know about this self realization and self knowing is if you read between the lines an out and out kundalini experience huh? that he had that he had yeah um, if you, it's such a different book compared to what comes after that he doesn't use i'm not sure if he uses the word kundalini but if you read it it's very clear it's a small very thin booklet i think it's available as a free pdf download so that is where maharaj started yeah there's another interesting thing which uh, i'll show the graphic on the screen right now but you won't be able to see it but um 
regarding Maharaj. He, he said to Jean, to Jean Dunn towards the end of his life, he said, forget I am that. I realized so much more since then. It's so much deeper. <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. I thought of another example that we could use with regard to, um, you know, free will and uh, how how compelled we are by our conditioning and genetics and so on and and it actually relates to climate change you know these days there are a lot much more severe hurricanes and they come more frequently and later in the season and all that stuff and um, we can't really do anything about a particular hurricane because um, the conditions for its creation have already been set up but those conditions took several centuries to be created you know since the start of the industrial revolution so like that i think that you know, there are many things that will beyond our, be beyond our control in life at this stage of the game, but it's taken a long time to create the milieu, you know, the, the state of mind in which we would do a thing like that or be able to resist or not be inclined to do a thing like that. Um, so I don't know. You've, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I feel, Rick, that ultimately everything that arises including tornadoes and you know earthquakes etc all are arising in consciousness yeah and the, the karmic law is actually a law of give and take so i am not one to say that oh you know advaita doesn't believe in all this doesn't get into that many people say that these are not to be considered well i was <laughs> using that more as a, a metaphor or an analogy you know about the climate and particular storms this is in the analogy relating to our life and let's say a person uh, is tempted to commit a crime or something like that um, and they, they commit the crime and and we you know they can't help but do it they're just compelled by their their nature but it took a long time to you know their history who knows how far back a person's history goes if, if we get into the whole reincarnation thing it's taken a long time right. to develop a state in which they would be inclined to do such a thing and like you say we have a little bit of wiggle room and uh, right. and you're not going to become a completely different person overnight but you can keep using that wiggle room to change the mental atmosphere so to speak just just as we could do now things to mitigate co2 in the atmosphere and ch gradually you know reclaim a healthier climate in which severe hurricanes won't arise sure and you know it reminds me of uh, dr robert Svoboda. i think he's been on your he show has, yes. and his son uh, on vimlananda's uh, who was incidentally from mumbai vimlananda his guru and in one of the books, Vimlananda talks about a lady called Mamra Ben and him killing each other in consecutive lifetimes. And he said that I have to be in so much awareness that the pattern does not repeat in this lifetime because when the thought comes to her, she is going to act. And I'm the one who has to be in awareness to break that chain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just paraphrasing this, but I clearly remember reading it. So that is what you are referring mm -hmm. to, that little bit of wiggle room. Yeah. You know, you know, it's like coming back to Ramnam Harshi. There is no destiny and free will for the jnani. No, say you that see? again. So there is no destiny, nor is there free will for the jnani because he's transcended. Right. Both. It's no longer relevant right? to him. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly with one could use the term evolution in this sense, spiritual evolution, that one gets out of these dynamics and equations eventually. Eventually. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, I just re remembered that Swami Sarvapriyananda was saying last night that we have this fleeting moment, you know, where we could exercise that wiggle room and either reinforce our samskaras and, and deepen the addiction to a particular tendency, or we could weaken them by choosing not to do the thing. And uh, and either way, it's not going to be all or nothing. We're not going to totally eradicate such tendencies on the spot, but we will, you know, move in one direction or the other of either eventually eliminating them or making them even more compelling. Yes, and I think grace plays a very big role here. You see, Rick uh, Osho was very right when he said that you know it's easy to kind of. Uh, surrender to a master who's passed away just i'm giving an example uh, of what he said <laughs> you know because yeah. you don't really have to bow down right 
And when you actually surrender the ego to another individual who you think is an individual. Right. As, some, as someone put it, dead gurus don't kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so I'm coming to the point of grace here, actually, that when you accept that there is a higher intelligence, a higher power, which will help you in that wiggle room, you know, because if you're left to yourself, you're going to create a mess of that wiggle room because you'll be struggling and struggling. But when you accept that there's something far bigger at play, something which humbles you, truly humbles you. You know, Ramnam Harshi said when he was asked, how do I know that a sage is a sage? He said by the two things, the degree you peace, of peace you feel in his presence and the sense of respect that you feel for him. And he said, by the humility he expresses. And Ramesh used to be asked the same thing. How do I know a genuine sage is genuine? He said, I don't know that, but I know when a sage is not genuine, when there's an absence of humility. So humility, when we are forced into these very tight spaces in life, which is so often, uh, and a kind of, you know, a surrender to a higher power is what gives us that maneuverability yeah. On the on the point of grace that you were just discussing, I heard a story uh, about um, dairy farmers in India, and they could tell which calves would live or die by, you know, when the calves were born, they had to stand up and start walking pretty soon. And the farmers would help them, and the, the, the calves that were actually making an effort to stand up on their own and with a little bit of the farmer's help, they knew those ones would live. But the calves that wouldn't even try, uh, and the farmers had to lift them entirely without the calf helping, they knew those calves aren't going to make it. Mm -hmm. Really, that's beautiful. And it reminds me of the new an astrologer who's now passed on, and he was diagnosed with cancer, and he had an ashram in Vrindavan, in, you know, which is Krishna's uh, place. And uh, Rick, he got cured of his cancer, so the doctors were quite surprised and asked him what he did. And he said, I absolutely did nothing, so even I'm surprised how I got cured. And then he thought about it and he realized that for six months, he was walking in front of the goshala, the cow shed, up and down, up and down. And he, he, he said that I would feel the cows looking at me <laughs> while I was walking all the time. And then he got this insight that somehow they had something to do with it. I wouldn't be surprised. Because, he had, I mean, that was quite fascinating. I mean, it was really uh, very touching to hear because I have heard stories of how pets have taken away illnesses of their pet owners and then died. Yeah. Uh, many cases like this. So this, that's the thing, Rick. It is so beautiful. Anything is possible in this journey. And our disdain for the animal kingdom is what is shocking. Mm. And I remember once one lady had visited Ramana Ashram and as you might know, Bhagwan used to, you know, he was, had such a great relationship with the monkeys and the crows and the cows. And so she was extremely upset. She said, you know, I left that place because, I mean, everything was fine. But till I saw that there was a samadhi for a crow and a dog, I thought this is really the pits, you know. <laughs> and, and so she ran from there. And so we went for a cup of tea after the satsang. And I said, you know, I feel it's far more simpler for an animal to get liberated than a human being with all the complexities in the mind. So why is that so shocking? Mm. But she could not stomach that, basically, mm. you know. And uh, this is another thing, because I do feel that, uh, you know, compassion for life other than ours is something which happens naturally with any understanding yeah. of what's actually going on. Yeah, you know, Jesus said, whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. Yes, yeah. beautiful. And the point of that cow story with the baby cows is that it's God helps those who help themselves. So, you know, yeah. God yeah. will help us, but we have to sort of make an effort from our side as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, question came in. This is from Govinda in Pune. Um, could you please talk about, related to Maharaja's teaching, holding on to I am and how it can lead to realization? And he, he also asked, could you also please talk about self-inquiry, which I guess is pretty closely related. Go ahead. 
Yeah. So I think uh, this is very beautiful. The, the first part of the question is what I can relate to absolutely because what happened, Rick, was there was no question of holding on to the I am. The, the presence of I am is what got uncovered when the thinking of thinking mind of the ego dissolved. So when Maharaj would constantly say, abide in your being, abide in your being, be in the I am. Mm. You Which know, was his instruction what, from Siddhameshwar, his guru. Yeah. Yes. And so what happened uh, for me was with Ramesh's teaching and Eckhart, because I do feel Eckhart was a tremendous influence in my life. When the ego stopped going, uh, dancing the jig and getting involved in drama and stories, the natural outcome was the abiding in the being. You know, the, 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 the natural outcome of the thinking mind of the ego being completely pushed into the background was the abiding in your being emerged. So that was the beauty. And that's why I say to anyone, you know, when you just look at your life through the lens of uh, concepts like all these concepts are tools, doership, free will, destiny, pick what you like. As long as it brings you to peace, you find that when your thinking mind is disengaged, you are naturally abiding in your being. So rather than making abiding in your being such a laborious effort where the ego gets frustrated that I am not able to abide in being, the annihilation of the ego itself through the process of life and living is what leads to a natural abiding in one's being. So it's so important that your life is sorted out on a level of daily living because, you know, otherwise you're going to have inharmonious relationships, you're going to have conflicts in the day and you're going to come home and sit in the evening and say, okay, now I'm going to abide in my being for an hour. <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah. You see, so I think it's an all encompassing thing and that is what if you ask people who've been impacted by these teachings, you know, it, it's a natural outcome that you, abiding in your being is abiding in peace, the peace of being, the peace be still. Yeah. I think another way of phrasing it is just in terms of the, the level of excitation of the mind. Um, if, yeah. if a mind is sort of unanchored to being, we could say, then it's kind of like a boat on a choppy sea, which is just getting tossed all over the place. Um, but you know, when sort of the, the awareness of the deeper, quieter levels of the ocean of the mind um, arises or the mind gets, you know, it just it just doesn't get so stirred up. It, it, the very, very yeah. subtle impulses of thought are adequate to serve the function of thought. It, it just isn't allowed to get to such an excited state. Yes, that's actually very beautiful what you said. And that's what happens. The excitement levels, you know, this kind of up down uh, movement gets reduced. Yeah, yeah. So what was earlier going like this is now like this, like a blip. Yeah, I know. I forget the words. There's something in there's these four levels of speech in Sanskrit. You may remember them. There's Baikri, Pashanti, Madhyama, yeah. and Vak. That, that's it, I think. Or Para, 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 which Para, yeah. Para, which is the source. Para, Pashyanti, when thoughts emerge. Madhyama and Vaikari is when the speech is released from the tongue. And that is why Ramana Maharshi's teaching was in silence from Para, Para Vak. And there's that beautiful story of Ganpati Muni, who was this great, great devotee of Bhagwan's. And he wrote about 700 verses in praise of the Divine Mother, and then he hit a roadblock. And so he went to Bhagwan and said, you know, I'm stuck. And Bhagwan said, all right, I'll come and sit with you. So he sits through the night with Ganpati Muni. And what happens? Ganpati Muni's students are there, and he starts telling them, you take down the first line of the first work verse, you take down the first line of the second verse, you take down the first line of the third verse. And then the second line of the first verse, the second line, and he goes on at the end of a few hours, when it's all over, he says, Bhagwan, it's finished. And Ramana Maharshi said, so you took down all that I dictated. <laughs> and Ramana hadn't uttered a that's word. That's great. So that was flowing from Para. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, that is why silent teachings, of course, the teachings have to emerge from a being who's established in silence. Just being quiet is not going to do it. Uh, but 
they as he would say you know silence is the true speech and they are so beautiful when one is absorbed in that because the tongue tends to even burn away the efficacy of words like i had a friend who was an adept in mantra chanting you know and he said even when you say i love you takes away the feeling the depth of i love you which is in your heart because the the tongue burns a bit of it mm, that's good so and and many people who are not expressive are actually condemned for not being expressive or you don't express yourself etc etc but deep down they may have such beautiful and pure feelings so we are too quick to judge people who are quiet and silent yeah i have a friend whom i've interviewed a couple of times susanna marie and she she said that she actually just doesn't have the voice in the head kind of thoughts that most people have you know oh i think i'll go to the grocery store and buy some blah, blah, blah. you know it's just like there's just no words in the head kind of thoughts and so she must be operating it maybe that what is it vishanti is that the subtlest one yeah uh, <laughs> where, where the thoughts are just sort of subtle impulses yes. i've also heard interesting stories about saints who could actually understand foreign languages because they could just pick up on the impulse of a person's thought before it actually emerged as a specific language and and catch the meaning from just that subtle impulse yes absolutely and i think it was uh, niranjananand saraswati when he was a young boy of the bihar school of yoga mm -hmm. where he was a naughty child who would not learn anything and his guru decided to teach him when he was asleep <laughs> that's great <laughs> did he learn uh, yeah oh my god uh, Okay, we have like three questions that came in here. This is from my wife, Irene. She says, as one's consciousness or awareness evolves, the humane treatment and compassion for animals should grow. I have met people who purport to be spiritually advanced who do not have much of this sensitivity or love developed. Is it more a matter of inclination or affinity, or should this not be a marker of one's development? Well, Rick, I'm again a bit of a traditionalist on this because, uh, you know, if uh, you have a natural uh, recognition of the oneness of all life, then it is, uh, you know, a natural outcome that your compassion arises for, let's say, the animal kingdom. Now, I can understand, you know, if uh, it, it's not the be all and the end all, although Ramna Maharshi, and I keep referring to him simply because I'm so impacted by him, it was very clear that, you know, I mean, you have to see God in everything. Even Shirdi Sai Baba would say the same thing. I can understand, let's say, if you are in the highlands where you, you don't have the option of vegetation and generations and generations, like I read, I don't know if it's true, that in the Tibet of old, they would only eat meat which was killed by a natural cause, and they found it. They would not kill animals. I don't know if that holds to, true today, but that makes sense to me. And I can understand if one is running on a kind of conditioning where from birth one has been eating a particular uh, food, let's say. And if one is as evolved as, as a Sri Aurobindo and one transcends the limitation of the food being consumed, like let's say he was having fish, that's, you know, a one-off. But for us normal people, I think it would just be I, I mean, it's common sense, Rick, that, you know, if there was a respect for life, there, there would be a, a different uh, a way of seeing things. Yeah. It's, I'm reminded of the Native Americans who, um, you know, obviously killed buffalo and all in order to eat, but they wouldn't kill for sport. And, and they were completely aghast when the railroads were built and trains would stop and people would, could just shoot buffalo from the train for a little bit of fun and then the train would keep going leaving the buffalo all dying in the field they, they thought these people are crazy you know yeah and you know i was a hardcore non-vegetarian about uh, 20 years ago and once i had visited varanasi and the taxi driver told me uh, come i'll take you to this old blind sage who was 90 years at the time and i sat next to him and he said uh, that I see that you eat meat. <laughs> I you was just quite see it, surprised. Huh? He saw it. I don't know how yeah. if he was blind, ah. but that's what he said. Interesting. And he said, you know, my son, don't worry. In a few years, it will drop away. And that's what started happening. First, red meat was given up. And I can't even recall. It wasn't even a moral ground, frankly. Yeah. I just kind of lost the taste for it. 
lost the taste and never missed it. And then there was white meat and chicken. And I love chicken. I used to have it three times a week. And then there was a gap of two, three months and I tried to eat it and it felt like stones in my stomach. I was like shocked. I said, is this what, what I was conditioned to? And then I went to South India to an Ayurvedic center, which is where my mother used to go there for a month every year. Mm -hmm. And the head doctor, who, you know, they read the pulse. Right. So yeah, I've, I've done panchakarma and all that stuff. And, yeah. Right. So he held my pulse and he said, oh, I see you've stopped eating meat. <laughs> I was <Wow>. shocked. <laughs> yeah. And on a, on a more kind of uh, material level, Rick, it's so obvious that you know, the fear enzymes which are secreted by an animal which is being slaughtered is what, what we are ingesting. You know, I mean, if if one is aware of one's dreams, you can even see in the dream state, the dreams which come when you have a particular non-vegetarian meal in the night because it plays on the subconscious. Even that happens. Yeah. And of course, I don't know about India, but over here they pump the animals with antibiotics, you know, because otherwise they don't survive very well in the very unnatural conditions in which they're raised and that that yeah. gets into the meat but it also is rendering antibiotics useless for human beings and it's re generating all these super bugs and so on which are anti antibiotic resistant bacteria yes and now i think they are trying to make mock meat and all these other concepts are coming and yeah, so I mean, I do when I go to like a seaside town like Goa, if there's fish on the menu, I may or may not have it, but there's absolutely no kind of uh, impulsion. It's dispassion yeah. as far as uh, this is concerned. But I would agree with Irene that I think at least that's what she's trying to say, that it would be natural. Compassion for all living beings would be natural. Yeah, I forget who it was I was interviewing not too long ago. And you know how the Jains are so super careful about not killing anything whatsoever. But we were talking about how it had sort of grown in us kind of spontaneously that, you know, you you can't step on an ant on the sidewalk or something. I mean, it's just you you just recoil from from doing that naturally, not out of some belief, but just more out of the sort of the oneness feeling of, of an appreciation of, of all life. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Shift well, any more on that or should I ask another question? No, go okay. ahead. Okay, shifting gears. So this is from um, Jay Jeffrey in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, the Sargadatta said that the book I Am That was for that particular time, and his latter books were more advanced. Um, how much more advanced can a spiritual book get? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't all spiritual books pretty much repeating what every other spiritual book is trying to convey? And then are Ramesh's books more advanced than the Sargadatta's? I don't know if we use the word advanced, Rick, because we published a book called Beyond Freedom, which is uh, 10 tapes which Mullar Patan had given me. And in those, in one of the tapes, he says that, but he says, I am that was for that time. This is for this time. He didn't say this is advanced. You see, it was like I remember uh, when I was new to Ramesh, earlier Ramesh was saying there's no free will. But then Ramesh realized that the import of that communication is getting missed and people are misinterpreting it. And so he changed it to there is free will as a mechanism of daily living without which you can't function in life. So it's not that this teaching was advanced compared to there's no free will. So I don't think that's what the masters are referring to. It, it, it just evolves as a teaching and what was presented then through them as an instrument and what is presented now is different. Yeah, I think evolves is a key word there. Um, you know, naturally teachings evolve and as teachers teach, the longer they teach, the more they kind of, you know, see what works and what doesn't and better ways of saying things and, and so on. And plus there, are, I, I believe that everybody's a work in progress and that even someone like Nisargadatta was probably still advancing in his spiritual growth. And uh, in a Tibetan course, which I did, it clearly says that the teaching itself evolves with each new generation. There you go. So the way it gets represented, new instruments come to present the same teaching. Yeah. But the words may be different, the, the delivery may be different, and that is again a natural process. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, let's see here. Here's a... Oh, okay. Ne never mind. This wasn't a question. Um, okay, good. So let's 
let's kind of like assess where we're at now in terms of what we've been discussing and what more we want to discuss. We have another, you know, 20, 30 minutes or something if we like. Um, what are there some things that we haven't covered that you would like to get into? Um, not particularly. I mean, All right. whatever it would be I'd like to get into would be leading to peace of mind. <laughs> oh, we could just sit here and close our eyes for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, let me just... You know, uh, Rick, as Vimlananda would say, and I truly believe this, that the the test of any teaching is its impact in daily living. And, you know, here in our schools, we had this uh, concept of surprise tests. So one was the exams which were declared like these are the half term exams, the yearly exams. And then one was where suddenly you go to class and the teacher will say today's a surprise test. And you know the true words of how much a student has learned with the surprise test because otherwise they have to prepare. And Maharaj would say. The expected seldom happens, the unexpected always does. And therefore. Life is an ongoing surprise test. And therefore. Peace of mind becomes all the more important because, as you said, whether your boat is in choppy waters or whether you can sense the depth of the ocean while you're going through life, it all comes down to that. So I know I'm kind of repeating this point to a degree of boredom, but truly that has been my experience and that's what I feel is worthy of sharing that it comes down to the tests. One could call it the tests because life is full of surprises and how we deal with it. No, that's very good. And I think there's repeating things is a good way of teaching, actually. Um, you know, I mean, because we don't always get things the very first time and I repeat. Yeah. yeah. And Ramesh would, would be uh, charged with this crime that, you know, you say the same thing day in and day <laughs> out. His reply was, he said, the shell of the ego is so hard that it needs constant hammering to break. Yeah. And I mean, how many times did Ramana say, you know, self-inquiry or whatever? I mean, I'm sure he said many of the same things hundreds of times over the course of his teaching. So, and you know, the cool thing about that, though, is like with a teaching like that or a, a profound book like the Gita or the Bible or anything else, you can read it over and over again throughout the course of your life. And you just keep shifting to subtler levels of understanding. And um, even though you're reading the same thing over again, you don't get it. It's, so, so it's not only a matter of memorizing the words or anything. It's a matter of having the, the insight to realize the deeper values of a particular point. Yes. And I mean, it's with any book. If it's uh, I am that, if it's talk with Ramnam Harshi, I used to have this habit of underlining what I like. Mm -hmm. And when I would go back and read it, I was like, wow, did I underline that? <laughs> because there was a new insight. Yeah. You know? And what I feel that is, is a recognition because that is already that level of understand, understanding is within us already and it gets recognized. So there are layers, as you said, and with each unfolding, each peeling of the onion, you know, it kind of because it, it's already recognized by us. And it's just that the layers are getting peeled away and peeled away and peeled away. And that's how it operates. Yeah. Yeah, I've also heard that in the context of Jnana Yoga that you know, uh, someone on that path would kind of chew away at the same point over and over again and just kind of keep getting kind of deeper and deeper values of it. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's probably everybody's experience. Yes. Here's something, you know, that article I mentioned by Arindam Chakrabarti uh, that Swamiji mm -hmm. sent me, but uh, here's a point he made that I thought was interesting. He said, uh, according to classical yoga, only what's, what species or family one is born in, the length of life and the general hedonic quality of life, um, jati, ayus, and bhoga, are supposed to be determined by karma. The rest is left to human effort, deliberation, and environment. Um, there's a lot of elbow room for free will within such a theory of predestination. That's speaking of, you know, hammering on the same point over again. That's kind of what we talked about, but that, I just saw this quote here from him on that. Well, uh, Rick, my experience is that uh, the biggest happenings in my life which shaped my life, I had no control over. 
So, uh, you know, if I go by my own experience, then I don't find that quote to be so relatable for myself, but it could be for someone else. But uh, and I must say, because there was this very fortunate infusion of grace through the meeting of these people in my life, which kind of pushed me onto the path. And, uh, you know, I want to go back to one thing when Maharaj was asked that is there any benefit of being in the presence of a sage? And you could extend this to is there any benefit of being immersed in a teaching, let's say. And his reply was that the trees around a sandalwood tree in the forest start emitting the same fragrance. So when we hold on to any teaching that we are following and live it and breathe it, which is what sadhana is about, uh, you emit that vibration. It is so natural, you don't have to do anything for it. Because if one is contemplating on it, if one is viewing life situations through that prism, it becomes part of one's being. Yeah, that's very true. There, there's a sort of an osmosis or a, an entrainment that takes place. You kind of, to some extent, you know, rise to the level of vibration of the sage that, in whose presence you're sitting. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It is like the same friend I was talking about. One day we were sitting on the Marine Drive promenade near my house. And he said that, like, if a person does mantra chanting, like thousands of times a japa, like Om Namah Shivaya or something, and he's sitting there, like we were sitting on the ledge. And he said, if that person gets up, I can actually hear the chanting going on where he sat. So the point is the vibration. You will vibrate, your your being is vibrating at a certain frequency, if one can call it. So we don't, I don't know if that's too abstract. But that is why we are drawn to sages, right? We are drawn by the peace that we feel in their presence. Yeah, a number of times, um, Ama, you know, Amrita Nandamai, yeah. came to yeah. our area and in, in my, in my wife was instrumental in help setting up her visits. But um, one time I went to the house where she had been staying and there was a little puja room in which she had been, you know, meditating or whatever. And, you know, she'd gone by then. And But we went in there and it was like, ah, oh, you know, you just sort of sink into into silence just being in, in that room, which is just an ordinary room in an ordinary house. But the whole place had been yeah. kind of saturated. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you can imagine if, I don't know if you've been to Ramana Ashram, but the old meditation hall oh. where his couch is lying. Yeah, it must be it's profound. It's the same thing, you know, profound. And even if you are at Dakshineshwar, where they have preserved Ram Krishna's room since 1886, I think. When you enter that space, it's like a time warp, you know, you see it in Hollywood movies, but this is the real thing. You just completely, the mind shuts down, even now. It's quite fascinating. And that brings up an interesting point, which is that, you know, we all radiate a certain influence, whether we're a saint or a crazy person, we're, we're all radiating a certain influence. And that influence kind of saturates the world's atmosphere, all, all 8 billion of us collectively, you know, or the atmosphere is saturated with our collective contributions to it. And so you can understand how you know, if the percentage of people who are spiritually awakened or meditating or whatever um, increases, even perhaps a small percent, one, two percent, um, it could have a profound influence on the, the atmosphere of the whole world and actually change the behavior of people who, who never even thought about such things. I think Kamarishi Mahesh Yogi had these experiments, right, where the crime rate in towns came down because of a collective group meditating. Yeah, I was part of them. I, I once spent three months in Iran <laughs> doing, doing yeah, one of those things. I mean, it, yeah, and it's so true. And that is what the Satya Yoga is about, the age of truth. When consciousness, when understanding and humanity evolves to a certain level, we enter the age of truth, the Satya. Yeah. And that's part of my so, motivation in doing this show, actually, just the feeling that it, it helps the world, not only the individuals who listen to it or something, but the the whole world. I, and obviously Absolutely. this is just one of many contributions, but that's part of the thinking. Absolutely. So beautiful, Rick. And you mean like, you know, in Hindi we have a saying, Lambe race ka ghoda, which means a horse which runs a long race. You, know? ah. you mean like it for years, right? Well, personally, yeah, since about 1968. And then, and then this show since 19, uh, it's been about 12, 13 years now, 2009, yeah. I think I started. Yeah. 
So that's some great seva and great service that I can't even say you've been doing it, but that is happening through you. I have that feeling. You know, people sometimes say, yeah. oh, it's so wonderful what you're doing. And I think, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not doing anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's, just, that's not just a cliche. It's more like a feeling, you know. All right. So how can we go out with a bang? We've ca uh, talked about some nice things here. Um, can we touch upon that? Yeah, let's, but let's not actually demonstrate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, uh, Rick, I feel is, as we all know, all fears lead to the fear of death. And I see that when the understanding starts unfolding in people, it is actually the fear of the death of the me, the ego as a separate entity, which starts dissolving. And, uh, you know, when one sees that that process of, you know, as we've heard, dying while you're living starts happening, you, you know, you die to your patterns, you die to your reactions, you die to your complaints, you die to your judgments. Uh, automatically, this fear of death starts dropping away. The concern may still be that I hope I don't have a painful death, mm -hmm. which is a biological issue, yeah. here, you know. But uh, that fear of the of death, which is the fear of the unknown, what I find is that peace, when one is more and more at peace, that fear starts dissolving. And it, as the Buddhists say, it all comes down to that. And for me, I think for many people, death, like we said, for me, when my father died when I was 14, any form of death people are introduced to, whether it is death of a person, of an object, of a pet or so on. That truly is an opening, a doorway into understanding what death is about. And, you know, the only certain in, certainty in life is death. And we brush it under the carpet all the and time. And taxes, they say. Death and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, taxes. And, uh, you know, if we consciously look at this, especially today, especially today what's happening, Humanity has not been so collectively linked in their suffering as they have been today. Mm, yeah. And this is a period of deep transformation, deep suffering, deep transformation. The point is, do we go back to our old patterns or do we have deep insights and lessons from these? Yeah. Well, you know, Woody Allen said, I'm, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> and, that, yeah. uh, and there's something actually profound about that, you know, because if, if the self is realized, then you're not there when it happens in the sense that yeah, he meant it. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And there's also that line from the Upanishads, certainly all fear is born of duality. Um, you know, as long as there's a sense of duality, there's we're threatened. You know, there's a possibility of being harmed by something other than us. Yes, as Joel Goldsmith said that, uh, you know, the exit from the Garden of Eden was because of the belief in two powers, good and evil. So we've all, we're always picking up our sword. We are always uh, fighting, opposing. And when we drop that kind of thinking based on polaric opposites, when we see everything as a kind of stream of consciousness, what is, in fact, one of the most beautiful definitions of destiny, which Ramesh gave was destiny is what is, you know, as simple as that. What arises in the moment here and now is what we are faced with. And the fact that it has arisen in our awareness means it is already accepted by awareness. But then the me steps in and says, I reject this, I don't like this, I don't want this. And that's when again the drama starts. So, so dealing with the situation happens, but the first acceptance has already happened. So that fight, that opposition, that initial, I don't accept this part of duality, that drops away. Hmm. I once heard humility defined as the, the quality of not insisting that things happen any particular way. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. And you know what you were saying a few minutes ago about um, the pop quiz, you know, as opposed to the tests that you can study for. Um, you know, any activity, anything that happens to us, really the time to prepare for it has already passed. It's too late, you know, and uh, <laughs> throughout the day. It's, it's sort of like, so, so, but we can do things to prepare for any eventuality. And I'd say, you know, essentially those things are, well, of course, there's education and all that. But in terms of 
education is not going to help you if you get cancer or if your loved one dies or something like that. This is, we can sort of prepare for the, the quizzes of life by developing a spiritual depth that will enable us to face any circumstance with grace and equanimity. Yes, and you know, as we say in uh, Indian spiritual thought, you know, when you're a baby, your parents look after you, and thanks to them, you grow up and they bring you up. But suddenly you're faced with life and the challenges which life throws at. So why not seek and find people who have walked the talk, who have found their way through the vagaries of life, and get immersed in what they have to say, what the books have to say, because that's only going to help you along the way, rather than tackling it on your own, you know. And thinking that, you know, like, I mean, just it's incredible. We can see in one day how many thoughts come up where we automatically put up an opposition to it. It's just incredible. And, uh, you know, when that stops happening, then one is truly living life. Yeah, you're probably familiar with Byron Katie's teachings, you know, of just loving what is and not arguing with reality, not fighting against it. Yes. Yeah. It's like I remember when Eckhart was here in, I think, 2002. And like I said, the traffic in Mumbai is quite notorious. And it's not even easy to cross the street as such. Now, of course, it's very different. It's more organized. But we were driving somewhere and he said, just looking at the traffic, he said, no wonder there's so many people enlightened in India. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're so challenged by the traffic. Or Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've heard... Uh... Certain countries, the traffic laws described as suggestions, you know, <laughs> like red lights and things like, you know, maybe I'll stop. When I was in Iran, it was like that. You would hear crashes all the time from the hotel room because people would just sort of like not take it very seriously. Once I was in uh, Pune, a town which is near Bombay, and a flight got canceled, the return flight. So there was me and a German couple. So we decided to rent a car, hire a car and come back. And the driver was going all over the highway, zipping and all that stuff. So the, the man got very angry and he told the driver in English, are you driving on the left side of the road or the right side of the road? And the driver smiled and replied, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of an enlightened driver, wasn't he? <laughs> He probably didn't understand. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Very good at both sides. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's great. Uh, okay, so um, tell us about like you're not. I mean, you. Well, let me say, I've listened to all of your podcast episodes, and they're great. And you also have a YouTube channel with probably hundreds of hours of talks that you've given, uh, and you've written about five books. Um, and you also have a website. I'm going to show your website on the screen here for a minute. There is the website. Heaven is to be found in the heart. Oop, the, the quote changed. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, these are some things that people can plug into if they want to get more familiar with your work. Um, you want to elaborate on those a little bit, or, or is there anything else besides those that people should know about? Not really, Rick. It's if uh, if uh, peace of mind is what appeals to them, that's what I speak about in a very simple, relatable language. And that's because that's the way I have been made. And uh, I'm not too big on concepts and, you know, all that stuff. It's if it's something that appeals to them, then uh, that's great. Okay. And have we adequately covered the point about how to achieve peace of mind? And it just occurred to me that way, maybe we haven't. People might be thinking, oh, that sounds great, but I don't have it, and how do I get it? But I don't think we have time for well, that, right? Go into so, it for a few minutes if you feel like it. No, so for me, it was actually very simple because I followed a simple path laid down my, by my teacher where he said that as far as human interactions are concerned, when you accept that everyone is acting on their conditioning, you are no longer opposing people, and you can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. And and so, you know, I just found that it was so easy to maneuver through relationships because this entire labeling and judging dropped away like, uh, I mean, just like a castle made of sand, it just fell off. And when I just saw, saw people through this light of uh, just being, uh, it transformed relationships. And 
you know, I've had my share of uh, conflicts in that sense. I had a general manager who stole a lot of money from us and ran away. And truly, if you ask me that if I met him tomorrow on the street, what would I do and say? I'd probably ask him how he's doing and uh, why did he do that? But, you know, this whole kind of blame game and finger pointing and all that is, is toast. It's history. And so, you know, if we just look at these simple things like how do we use this concept, which sounds so vague of non-doership and we bring it down to just the human level. And then how do we accept as, you know, everything that is happening is God's will, not as an image of God, but as what consciousness presents itself here and now. You know, and the total acceptance, whether one likes it or not. And that again transforms. In fact, the whole situation gets transformed because if I don't fall into a particular action reaction loop and perpetuate that drama, you'll be surprised at how even out outcomes change because they are not being pushed by this kind of, uh, you know, auto feed of how things should be. And so this whole how things should be and what should be changes to what is. And so when that happens, then that peace of mind is brought into daily living. And so all that I speak about, which by and large is because, you know, I mean, uh, Maharaja told Ramesh that you won't parrot my words and you'll say it in your own style. And I tell people I parrot Ramesh's words because that's my life experience. When I went to Ramesh, I had no resistance at all to what he was saying because it was a validation of my life's experience. So when he would say nobody does anything, when he would say all there is is consciousness, it was so accepted to me. And then I assumed that everyone accepted it, you know, on the face of it. And uh, I thought that was it, but that was not it. People struggled with these concepts. The free will was so ingrained and so strong. And so for me, it was a validation of my life's experiences. And so that is what I speak about in all my talks, write about, and it always comes down to just that simple stuff. I mean, you know, Rick, I have met uh, yogis who have explained past lives to me of our relationships in the Himalayas, and it's beautiful. At one level, it's fascinating. You know, I, I, met, I was in touch with someone who actually got a message from above saying that, you know, you have two homes by the sea in India, and she had no way of knowing that I had a home in Goa, a small apartment by the seaside. But the more I kind of focused on what Bhagwan said, the state of equanimity is the state of bliss, all these fascinations with, you know, these kind of fantasies and all that, they started falling away. And uh, the, the gift of daily living started blossoming. <laughs> That's interesting. I was going to say, you know, it's interesting that just sort of deeply contemplating a, a different philosophical perspective about, you know, that the Ramesh was presenting to you really shifted your whole your state of mind. But it almost sounds like you were kind of ready for that. And, and it, it, to a certain extent, it already was your state of mind. And he just kind of confirmed it and maybe... Um, you know, solidified it a little bit, or not he, but just engaging with, with the ideas he was presenting. Yes, and you, you actually hit the nail on the head because, you know, I had my first book, Pointers from Ramesh Balsekar, and he wrote the foreword for that. And he said in that, that, you know, he realized awakening had already happened and that I was on the way to deliverance. And I went back and I told him that, how is it possible? Because if awakening happened, I would know it happened. He said, no, you wouldn't. And I would say, don't be absurd. If something happens, you know it happens. And so this kind of went nowhere. But you're so right, because maybe, you know, life had prepped me up and the suffering till that point in teenage years and all. You know, someone asked me recently, how was it like meeting Ramesh and Eckhart in a span of two months when you had no... You hadn't read their books. I had not read their books. I had no idea what they were saying. And, you know, I, I told them recently, it was like these two doses of COVID, you know, you get the first dose. <laughs> you mean the vaccine. You get the second yeah. dose. And that's kind of what happened. And so I'm, I'm truly fortunate that I went with an unconditioned mind because I had absolutely no background in all this. To Eckhart, I was completely unconditioned. And, uh, you know, thanks to my sister, not only in Hong Kong, but when he started giving talks in, you know, uh, Canada and 
Glastonbury and all that. I tagged along. I was the excess baggage. So they would spend time together and just by being in his presence, I think that is where I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And similarly with, I started reading Ramesh's books perhaps after one year after attending his talks. So the unconditioned vacant mind, free of this heavy load of concepts, it really helps. Yeah, well, there was a lot of grace in your life, it sounds like, and uh, and you took advantage of it. God helps those who help themselves, and, uh, you know, it's it's really great. And it's, it's wonderful what you're doing, publishing these books and popularizing these ideas. Yeah, and that was also an accident of fate, getting into publishing. Yeah. I mean, you know, my mother had this experience, and she was doing all these drawings, and half the people said, don't publish it because people will laugh at you and this is secret knowledge. And the other more progressive half said, no, no, you must because others are going through it. In fact, one lady had come to Ramesh's who was under psychiatric treatment because she was having similar visions. And so Ramesh sent her to my mom and, you know, she said, oh, my God, this, these things happen. They really happen. That was fascinating. And so. This is how we approached publishers, Rick, and they said, oh, nice book, but her drawings are in color. Either we make them black and white or you give us the money. And I said, if I'm giving you the money, I might, might as well do it. it. Yeah. Does your mom still? Then, oh, I'm sorry. Continue. And then I made all possible mistakes one could make in publishing. I got cheated on the paper, the printing. I went to a bookstore. I put five books there. They never paid me for those five books. And that's. You know, I learned everything in that first book. That is also grace. So we should not judge our failures too quickly because those same mistakes were never repeated. Does your, everything is does your mom consult with people who are having Kundalini symptoms? And, and yes. Oh, that's yes, interesting. Yes. That's good to know because a lot of people get in touch with us, you know, who are some of them who are really having a hard time of it. And she would be a good resource to refer people to. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just want to read out this email from a person who has been immersed in the teachings. And she says, I recently lost my cousin to COVID. I had always wondered if all this understanding would stand true if I lose somebody close to me. And yes, I am hurting, but I am not suffering. I know she is in a better place. I know she is being taken care of. And that was it for her and I'm okay with that. Tears come. It hurts to think of her 10 year old daughter who lost her mom, but I am not suffering. There is acceptance for what is. The understanding has helped me immensely. The question, why did this happen, doesn't even come up. COVID has now entered our home. My father-in-law is positive, but COVID has been unable to enter my being. I am able to do what needs to be done without fear. Everything is happening. I am not doing anything. Even in the midst of intense sanitization rituals and managing home with no maids and dealing with an emotionally disturbed husband, I have not lost my peace for a single moment. Gratitude is all I feel for whatever is. That's beautiful. And on that note, uh, Rick, as you must be knowing, it's been a very painful few weeks in India. The second wave has devastated us. There's been a loss of many lives. And uh, you know, I am reminded, Rick, in 2008, there was a terrorist attack in Mumbai and we had some people in the in the five star hotel from the States. And I think that was the last time I actually spoke with Eckhart. I was in the office and a phone call was organized with him. And, uh, you know, he said, there's not much we can do except offer our presence and so if you are okay we can just be on the phone call in silence 
And so I told my telephone operator that don't disturb us. And I don't recall whether that was a 10 minute silent conversation or half an hour. I, the memory has gone. But if just for a minute we can offer our being, our silence, which is the most precious gift we have, which we can give another, especially someone who is suffering immensely and uh, such immense pain and suffering India has faced. And that's perhaps the best we can do where we are. Yeah. Are you suggesting that you and I do that right now? Or are you saying in, ge in yeah, general? Maybe, uh... No, just now, right now for a minute. OK, good. You, you, okay. you tell us when we want to stop, well, but otherwise we'll just sit in silence. That's it. It started. Okay, good. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Gautam. It's wonderful spending time Thank with you. Thank you for two hours of your time and for really giving uh, this opportunity to share these beautiful teachings with everyone familiar with your beautiful channel. And I wish you much growth, success, prosperity. And I do hope more and more people in India get familiar with it because they would love your content. Yeah, and most of them speak English. I mean, you know, a lot of people do, all right? Yes. So, yes, yeah. yes. Well, good. <clears throat> and uh, I hope to meet you in person someday. Hope so. Look forward yeah, to it. I haven't been to India since 1986, but if I ever get over there, I'll, I'll make a point. <laughs> you better. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. And, and thanks to those who've been listening or watching. I uh, really appreciate your um, participation. And uh, there's an upcoming interviews page on batgap.com where you can see what we've got scheduled and, you know, the day and the time. And, and there's always a link to the live stream of, of the interview in case you'd like to watch it live. And there's a question form on the bottom of that page through which you can submit your questions, which is how we've been getting them. And I, I think my guest next week is Anita Morjani. You probably know Anita, don't you? Yeah. Yes. And um, she'll be number 600 and we'll... Um, we'll actually be talking about her new book, which is Sensitivity is the New Strong. Um, so, and probably other things we'll talk about. All right, so thank you all. Thank you, Gautam. Take care. Thank you. Take care.